Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Your observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your evangelist of the imagination and the as yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That is right. It is me, Robert Myburnett, coming at you. Thanksgiving 2022 for Observations, episode number eight. 820, my God. Have I done 820 of these things? Did ever think I'll catch Joe Rogan? Probably not. But anyway, hey, it's Thanksgiving. I hope you all have something to be thankful for. I was asked what I'm thankful for and uh, yesterday on the show, on the John Campy Show, and I said this. I am thankful for my very existence. I'm also thankful for my existence at this point in time in history where I can be an imagination connoisseur like you. You imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post-geek singularity community. But I know exactly, because I met my biological mother, how close I came to never existing at all. Which was kind of a tough pill to swallow when you really think about it. But uh, luckily, I am here. I am happy to be surrounded by friends and family that I really like. I like having uh, these venues to talk to you guys. I am happy that most recently our film Tango Shalom was blessed by the Pope. That's right, ladies and gentlemen boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify. It was pretty cool that Pope Francis blessed Tango Shalom in an article in the Vatican newspaper, no less. Uh, so there you go. Um, and think about, it. When, isn't it great? We've got streaming services, hot and cold running water, the medical technology that we have, the communications technology that we have. we got the JW Webb Telescope. <laughs> I'm thinking JW Pepper. The... Um, the web telescope in space. We've got lots of great things to be uh, thankful for, and hopefully the rest of humanity will sort itself out in our lifetimes. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to be optimistic, I suppose. I try and be optimistic. You never know. But anyway, so something, something got me thinking. And um, fandom. I'm always thinking about fandom. I'm always thinking about Who's a fan? Why are we fans? What's fandom all about? Why do we why do we have such divisive opinions over things these days? It didn't used to be that way the way it is here. Like I used to go to science fiction conventions and in my lifetime there wasn't a lot of great sci-fi media. And what I mean by that is television and movies. It was really books and to a certain extent there were comic book conventions too. But um when I was younger, if you weren't a, if you hadn't read at least, I don't know, the top 25 basic books of classic sci-fi canon, you had a hard time carrying on conversations at science fiction conventions. Even when I was younger, like you had to read Dune. <coughs> you had to have read Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land. I can't tell you the last time I talked to anybody that has read Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. But when I was like 14 years old, if you hadn't read Stranger in a Strange Land, other fans would be like, what's wrong with you? I mean, I, I wore a pin around in junior high school that said, I grok Spock. Nowadays, if I wore that pin, people would say, what does grok mean? And it used to be that I wouldn't have to explain that term to sci-fi fans. You got to look it up. I'm not going to tell you what it means. You got to find out. 
preferably you find out by reading Robert Heinlein's superlative novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. God only knows, maybe that's been canceled or something. But, you know, you had to have read like Dune, you had to have read Arthur C. Clarke, like you had to have read Childhood's End, you had to have read Asimov's The Foundation Trilogy, you had to have read to a certain extent H.G. Wells, you had to understand that War of the Worlds was actually a Victorian novel, it wasn't set in the modern 50s. You know, there were all kinds of things that were just expected of you, but nobody would ever, like, call you on it. They just assumed that you knew. And the thing about it was, is that of course you knew. Because when you started out as a science fiction fan, it usually began with books. And for me, my journey, I mean, the first, really, the first books I've read are the first, I mean, I had kids' books, Frog and Toad are Friends, the was it the eight Chinese brothers, those illustrated children's books that you had. Then I sort of graduated to Roll Doll. I mean, I loved Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, James the Giant Peach, Danny the Champion of the World. I love those books. My dad read Star Trek books to me. <clears throat> but as you, you grew older, uh, you learn more and you, you graduated. It was a literary journey, really. Uh, to be a fan and you read comics of course I read a lot of comics when I was a kid and then what really solidified it for me there were there were two two things that really turned me into I mean I, as a kid you know starting at five years old I was a rabid Star Trek fan rabid Star Trek fan and to be a Star Trek fan at that time was to want to know everything you could about it there was no internet of course so when you'd get like the Starfleet Technical Manual that was introduced in 1975 and the blueprints, the Franz Joseph blueprints, a really interesting thing happened. So in 1975, for those of you who don't know, there were two published items by Ballantine. They, they put out the Star Trek blueprints and they put out the Starfleet Technical Manual. But the conceit of both of these things, even though they were, you could tell from the packaging, they were Star Trek. They, but when you took the packaging out, like the Starfleet technical manual came bound in a sort of a plastic cover, protective cover that said Starfleet on it. So the conceit of these things was that it was from the 23rd century and it was written for the most part as if it came from the 21st century. And it wasn't exactly scintillating. Like say you pick up the history of Westeros. This was, this was a technical manual that had things in it like Starfleet uniforms, it had different variations of the Enterprise that we'd never seen before with one nacelle or a dreadnought that had three nacelles, but it was like it was real. So when you held it in your hand, especially when I was like, when I was 75, I was like eight. And it was, it was a big deal. You know, you held this thing in your hand. And then the, the blueprints of the Enterprise, all the decks, you could take them out and unfold them. They were large size. And between the Enterprise blueprints and the technical manual, suddenly... You were no longer just a fan of a TV show. You weren't just going like, okay, wait a minute. There was the United Earth Space Probe Agency, and then there was the Federation. What's the difference? You know, I didn't understand that as television shows evolved, their nomenclature evolved, their mythology and canon evolved as well. Um, but these books made it seem like the Star Trek universe was much bigger than uh, it was on television because, wow... There were 12 other, and you saw this. One of the things about Star Trek that people forget, and I've talked about it a lot on the show, is that when another, I mean, for, for a production issue, if they wanted another Starfleet vessel, they could build, they could go build a model kit of the, the AMT model kit of the Enterprise and just put new numbers on it. So in the second season of Star Trek, when they made the Doomsday Machine and they wanted to have the Constellation, um, <laughs> uh, the Enterprise was NCC-1701. Well, what they did was they bought an off-the-shelf model and made it NCC-1017. <laughs> Problem solved. There's the USS Constellation. And that's what they did. But in Star Trek, they would add to canon, like, suddenly. And then the, 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 the technical manual, you know, named all the ships. We got some of the names. Uh, and you heard them on the show. And we saw some ships, like the Defiant we saw, you know, the Lexington, the Hood, whatever. Uh, but then there was like the Congo. I didn't know there was a starship named the Congo, but there it was in the technical manual. So anyway, you got sucked in, you got drawn in. And and then as I started to read more books, I stumbled across the thing that really made me a literary sci-fi fan as a kid 
was when my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Walton, and uh, I was nine. My fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Walton, fourth grade was a big year for me when I was nine years old because a couple of things happened. One, Mrs. Walton read John Christopher's Tripods trilogy to us, The White Mountains, The City of Golden Lead, and The Pool of Fire, or as I like to say, My Harry Potter. These were young adult novels uh, that were set in the far future where aliens, these very alien aliens, had conquered Earth, had basically sent everybody back to the Middle Ages, and they lived in these dome cities and they were getting ready to terraform earth although most people didn't know it and they traveled around the countryside in these giant tripods it was much bigger than that but i was totally fascinated i couldn't believe it i, I was like this is as good as star trek this is as good as well wasn't as good as star trek but it was better than space 1999 even though i like space 1999 and at the same time there was outer limits it was twilight zone you know i was into it man i was i was deeply deeply immersed into fandom <laughs> As an, I mean, I took it really seriously. Like, I was really serious about it. Like, you don't fuck with me. Serious. My parents were like, I, I wasn't a weird kid, though, because I had lots of friends. I played sports. You know, we had a, a large group of kids in our neighborhood. So I was very social-minded. And I think that came out of, like, you know, the uh, Star Trek. You wanted to be, I mean, I want to want to be Captain Kirk. Even at eight, I, I, I loved women. You know, it's like, I need to know how to talk to them. You need to know how to you know, walk up and say hi without seeming smarmy or weird. But uh, that was all part of it too. But when I was, you know, when you're in a class and Mrs. Walton was reading uh, the, the, the White Mountains to us, you know, she would read it after second recess. So you'd go to lunch, you'd, you'd have lunch, you'd have second recess after lunch, and then either you put your heads down on a desk and she would read for half an hour. I couldn't deal with how long it took. I was like, what the hell's going to happen? I was so into these books I was so into the White Mountains because it was like, I didn't realize it, I guess because I hadn't really read novels at that point. I mean, I tried to, but I hadn't really done it. I was nine. What do you want? But then I just got this like idea like, well, why do I have to wait? I'm going to go buy these books. And I went and bought them. And I tore through these books. I tore through them. I read all three of them. I didn't know there was a fourth one later, but I never did know about it. I never to this day read the fourth book. But anyway, um, uh, so I read it. And then immediately I'm like, oh, my God. Because I love these books as much as I loved The Twilight Zone. Maybe not as much as Star Trek, but similar. And then <clears throat> I started to go get other science fiction books. And then I realized, and, and there, were, there were flyers for the science fiction book club. And I'm like, oh, my God. I went to my parents, and I'm like, um, you know, because I really, like, my allowance, I didn't have any money. I got, like, a dollar a week or some shit like that. And um, I asked my parents, I said, look, um, can you enroll me in the sci-fi book club? And, like, back then you got, like, four books for five bucks or ten bucks. It wasn't, it wasn't that much, but it was more than I had. My mom's like, you want, you want, do you want me to roll, enroll you in a book club? And I was like, Yes. Yes, I do. And I think uh, one of the first books I got was uh, Osimov's Foundation Trilogy collected into one volume. I want to say Terry, Book, Book, Terry Brooks, the first sort of Shannara book. By the way, I say Shannara because I interviewed Terry Brooks once and I go, I've been saying Shannara my whole life. How is it pronounced? He said, it's Shannara. I'm like, okay, cool. Anyway, and then I was off to the races. I mean, every month they were going to send me books. And I was reading everything, Hal Clement's like a uh, uh, mission of gravity or something. And I mean, I, I read everything, H I, I, hundreds of books. I mean, I was tearing through these books. And what was really interesting was as I read science fiction, I began to appreciate episodes of The Outer Limits more. And I began to notice that people that were writing like Harlan Ellison, Harlan Ellison, one of the great fantasists of our time, rest in peace, he had two collections I got through the Science Fiction Book Club called Dangerous Visions and, again, Dangerous Visions. Unfortunately, the third Dangerous Visions book never was published. I hear J. Michael Straczynski is the keeper of that flame, and maybe it will someday get published. But those short stories, amazing, amazing. And then I got turned on to horror, and I started reading horror novels like uh, once I realized that movies like The Manitou were based on horror novels, I went and read horror novels of Graham Masterton. I remember reading at summer camp. I read James Herbert's The Rats. And it, anyway, it led me down a, a path that I've still never gotten off of. 
The point was, what I very quickly realized is that all of this stuff was intertwined. The Twilight Zone episodes, Richard Matheson, you know, Charles Beaumont. I would notice Robert Block or, you know, Robert Block wrote the novel Psycho, also wrote a Star Trek episode. Actually, more than one. And then it became, it was all intertwined. And I realized, in order for me to understand all of this, to grok it all, I had to be aware of these things. I had to, I had to, you couldn't just watch a movie in a vacuum. You had to, you had to read the books too. You, like, like a, a boy and his dog. You, where'd that come from? You, I had to know. I had to go, bloods are over. What's going on here? I had to find all this stuff out. And I was sort of insatiable. I couldn't get enough. You couldn't get enough. And I was nine. In May of 1977, I turned 10. And there was a movie coming out, for those of you who might want to see where this is going. In 1977, Star Wars came out May 25th, 1977. Changed my life. Now, I was already, as I, you can imagine, steeped, steeped into this. You know, in the wake of Star Wars, all that. I just, I had just joined the science fiction book club when Star Wars had come out. It was kind of like in tandem. But when I saw Star Wars, like everyone else, it changed my life. I, there had never been anything that existed before that was remotely similar to Star Wars. But now with my inquisitive mind, I wanted to know everything there was to know. And when Star Wars I was reading, there were think pieces everywhere on the op-ed of every newspaper. I always read, I had a paper route too, and I always read the op-ed section of the paper, even though I didn't understand a lot of it. I always read it and looked at the political cartoons. After May of 1977, no one could stop drawing political cartoons with Darth Vader or Star Wars or whatever. It was everywhere. And you know, you wanted to learn all about Star Wars. And then I started reading interviews with George Lucas, and it was like Akira Kurosawa, and I'm like, who's that? You know, and there was no home video, so I couldn't go out and watch Hidden Fortress. I'm like, what's Hidden Fortress? What are the Dam Busters? I didn't know. You mean the World War II battle sequences in Star Wars? I mean, the, the, the X-Wing fighter over the Death Star, those are all World War II battle sequences that were originally cut into the film that ILM, the new ILM, emulated. All this stuff, it made me hungry for knowledge. And that's kind of how fandom was for me um you know after star wars i became a fan of movie soundtracks and i started listening to john williams and then you know john williams people forget but close encounters came out six months after star wars did it came out in november i think yeah it just celebrated last week was its 45th anniversary so you had star wars in may close encounters in november fucking mind-blowing i mean for a kid for a kid like me who was who was uh, there had never been big screen sci-fi epics now I had not seen 2001. I didn't see it until later, which was probably a good thing because I wouldn't have appreciated at the time because I was getting, you know, the pulp sci-fi fantasy that I wanted. But the point was, the, the point I'm trying to make is one thing led to another. Like it was all a continuum. Then you suddenly got interested in film music and then it was like, oh, you know, I, Logan's Run, the guy who did the music for Logan's Run, did the music for Planet of the Apes. And then it, was, it became a a thing so then you had to go out and get all this stuff and you you know I, I at 10 i was riding the bus going to downtown seattle going to bookstores going to comic book stores you know having i needed a paper out to buy stuff but the point was you had to learn as much like you'd want to know as when george lucas would say something in an interview like well i know a man with a thousand faces or whatever what was that who's joseph campbell then you have to go read joseph campbell i mean it was this insatiable desire for knowledge to understand where did all this come from and what could I see that would accentuate my enjoyment of what was going on on screen the stuff I loved and I always thought that that, that was just gonna, the way it was going to be but remember there was only Star Wars and there was only Close Encounters like these were the goats and then you'd see Planet of the Apes or something like that and then I had all the lesser 50 sci-fi movies that I loved because I was watching on the TV show, but TV shows like, but there was only Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, and then you saw some other things, the Irwin Allen shows like Land of the Giants and Time Tunnel and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Lost in Space, but those were, you know, those weren't like Star Trek because they were inherently kind of goofy, but I watched them anyway because they were science fiction, fantasy, and horror. That's what, what else did you get? You know, I mean, I was that kid that was scouring the TV guide looking at late night what movies I wasn't allowed to see. So when I got a VCR, changed my life. But so anyway, um, you know, it, but it, it, you, you had to know it all. At least I did. I had to know everything. 
And one of the things that was always interesting to me about science fiction is when you started reading about it, there were all these other things, mostly literary. Like there was a lot of talk about, I learned the word dystopian when I was like 10. I'm like, what does dystopian mean? What is a dystopia? I kind of knew what a utopia was, but what was a dystopia? And why did in the sev- why in the 70s was there so many dystopian science fiction movies, whether it was No Blade of Grass or The Ultimate Warrior or Logan's Run or The Final Program or Rollerball. Like, what, what did all that mean? I had to find out. I had to read up. You know, I read some dystopian science fiction. You know, it became a whole thing. I had to know. Anyway, what is the point of all this? Well, the point of all this is this. Star Wars... Um, in my mind, I know people are going to freak out when I say this, it was only really good for Star Wars and Empire. Because Star Wars, no one expected anything of it. It was kind of a fluke. It was so successful. It changed, it, it changed cinema. It changed everybody's imaginations. It was the, the impact that Star Wars had on culture and entertainment cannot be undersold. And it's hard to explain. I've said this on this show so many times. It's hard to explain how different things were after Star Wars came out. The possibility. But it wasn't just Star Wars. It was then Star Wars was the punch. And then Close Encounters was what would deliver the knockout. It was those two things. Um, and it, was, it elevated the science fiction, fantasy, and horror content. Because remember, there's definitely horror elements in Star Wars and Close Encounters. It elevated all of it. And just two years later, we got from the same studio, we got Alien again. Now, people, they understood what they were going to get from a space movie. So no one was that particularly surprised at the realism uh, of how convincing being in space and Alien was. But the actual verisimilitude of Alien, and I would dare say the verisimilitude of Star Wars, because this is pre-Empire. So you had Star Wars, Close Encounters, Empire, Superman the movie. There was all things. And by the way, Star Wars, Superman the movie was already in production when Star Wars had come out. So there was something going on, probably something to do with post-Vietnam. I don't know. You can, there's a lot to read about that. But but anyway, just changed. The world changed. But what it did was it turned so many people into fans that weren't fans before, especially Star Wars. And the thing is, for me, uh, Return of the Jedi remains the most disappointing movie that I, I've ever seen in my life because of the expectations I personally placed on it. I know everyone's like, ah, it's the first Star Wars movie I saw. I loved Return of the Jedi. I can only explain to people what a crushing disappointment it was for someone like myself that was so steeped in everything, that was reading classic science fiction, that was watching Twilight Zone and Star Trek, and but studying this stuff. And Star Wars and Empire were, and then everything that came out after that, 19, the summer of 1982, after, after Empire was released in 80, then, the, then the, the possibilities of fantasy filmmaking, it just kept getting pushed forward. I mean, in 79, you ended up seeing things like even low-budget horror, like Phantasm that Coscarelli had been doing. People like, well, he ripped off the Jawas. No, he started making Phantasm before Star Wars came out. But Phantasm and, and, and Dawn of the Dead and the slasher movies and After Empire, you had John Carpenter doing Escape from New York. And then in the summer of 82, you had everything from Cat People and Conan the Barbarian and The Road Warrior and Star Trek II and Poltergeist and Tron and E.T. and The Thing. Megaforce, if you're a fan of Megaforce. It all came out in the same three months, May, June, July. Mind-blowing, mind-blowing. But it was all different. Conan was very different than The Thing, which was very different than E.T., which is why The Thing didn't succeed, which was very different than Tron, which was very different than Star Trek II. Even Star Trek II. Star Trek was getting elevated with the motion picture in the wake of Star Wars. The point was, though, the ultimate point I'm trying to make is that fandom at that time was a bunch of inquisitive people that were looking into many different things. And I knew this because when you'd go to, we were all weirdos. And when we'd go to conventions, and I was going to conventions at a young age. But when I was going to conventions at like 13, 14 in Seattle, we had a great comic con and we had Norwest con, which is more of a literary sci-fi con. You had to know this stuff. 
You know, you you had to know your references. And not only that, the more you knew about history, the more you knew about sociology, the more you knew about psychology, it it accentuated how much you liked and appreciated these things. And and that's why Return of the Jedi was so disappointing. I, I'm like, why did you take this franchise that was just going elevated and you turned it into a, a goof? You know, I'm sorry, but the alien the alien designs in Return of the Jedi look like cartoon characters. And I understand that George Lucas, he thought he was making movies for kids when really we all knew that he was making movies for the kids and all of us. And I'm not going to rip on George Lucas. I mean, he had his own he, had, he has his own things that he had to deal with and everyone knows the contributions of Star Wars. A lot of people made that movie into what it was. But Return of the Jedi showed me that in a way that Star Wars was over for me i know people are now going what what no it was over and in pop culture star wars was it it petered out not that it wasn't always a thing but it it really did pop culture star wars left it left the consciousness of pop culture and it over the 80s after 1983 even even the toys you know um, there was an Ewoks cartoon series. There was the Droids cartoon series. But for the most part, Star Wars left. And I think rightfully so. Because Star Wars, and and yet, at the same time, you had the rise of home video and the rise of pay cable. So these movies played forever. And they were on all the time. And people were loving them and watching them over and over and over again. And it became a generational thing. Everybody, the entire planet became fans of Star Wars. What I think was missing and what I saw missing from fandom is fandom became because we had so many great movies, not so much on the TV side, but great movies that a lot of genre fans became strictly movie fans. And their love of, I mean, in one summer, in one three-month period of time, when you get Conan, when you get Cat People, when you get The Road Warrior, when you get Star Trek II, the same day as Poltergeist, you get E.T., you get The Thing. You get Blade Runner. You get Tron. Well, the wide variety of all that material was mind-blowing. And rather than leading people to books, you got more movies. You know, and and I think for a lot of us, we went back into the past and we started looking at older movies. And with home video, you could finally get them. You know, I could watch, you could, you I had seen Planet of the Apes, and a lot of Planet of the Apes movies were a staple, but You could study them. I could get all the James Bond movies. You know, I could go back and I could find obscure Universal Monsters and watch those over and over again. Slasher movies, everything. Suddenly, everything else but the movies themselves became, at least the people I knew, we were all film fanatics. And it was a lot less work to watch movies than it was to read novels and things like that. So the rise of great media... I think really curtailed um, reading science fiction novels. Now, the other thing that was happening in the 80s too is that comic books were undergoing a renaissance. Alan Moore hit the scene. Whether whether it was Swamp Thing, Frank Miller doing after Elektra and Daredevil doing Ronin then coming doing Dark Knight Returns. You know, and there was a renaissance in independent comics. So I was reading things like Howard Chaykin's American Flag, which was pretty, pretty sophisticated dystopian future America. But it was all... You know, it was amazing, and and it was a it, you you couldn't get enough. Where is all this taking me? Well, I would like to read an article that was in Deadline yesterday. Uh, Deadline, obviously, the great industry trade paper. Uh, Deadline had an interview with Andor creator Tony Gilroy. So, all of you people, whoever's time stamping this, put in at one o'clock. Uh, 30 minutes in, whatever the timestamp is right now, somebody write in the description or put in the comments, finally starts to talk about Andor 30 minutes in. (laughs) Somebody do that for me? (laughs) So anyway, um, Anthony D'Alessandro interviewed Tony Gilroy, Andor creator Tony Gilroy. And uh, it was a very interesting interview. And I'm just going to read what he said. So... Here's what, here's what uh, Anthony said. Was there something in history that the Andor season one finale was inspired by, especially that with everything that's going on in Ukraine? 
Tony Gilroy says, It's just so incredibly sad how easily available all of the things that seem contemporaneously sad are through history, and they just continue to repeat themselves. There are things all the way through the show, and I don't want to go through and quote chapter and verse, but Andor is the Russian Revolution. It is Montegard. It is the Haitian Revolution. It is the ANC. This is the Earth Gun Building, Palestine. This is the Continental Congress. This goes all the way. I mean, you could drop a needle in the last, I don't know what is recorded history, 3,000 years? Legitimately recorded, I mean. Slavery, oppression, colonialism, bad behavior, betrayal, hero heroism. I mean, it's a continuum. And then our boy goes on to ask, him and says the fleshing out of rebel co-founder Mon Mothma she feels like a nod to Nancy Pelosi this upper class person who knows she's a catalyst to make a difference and right wrongs Tony Gilroy answers her job description is a senator a longtime politician a power player doesn't get everything she wants doesn't get everything he wants I certainly wasn't thinking about the American Speaker of the House when I was writing the scripts. Then he goes on to ask, the cliffhanger where Cass Cassian lays his life on the line and faces off with Luth and Rail. Were you always planning that? I said we'd take 12 episodes across a year. We'll take this entire expanse of time and we'll take somebody who's completely disillusioned and completely self-interested and really having the worst day of their life and just someone who's turning into a roach. And we're going to turn that person in one year. We're going to make the first turn to being the guy who's in Rogue One. And we're going to make him sign up. And so, yeah, the final moment of this is a blood out. It took us this long to do it. It is what it is. The road to Damascus or its 12 stations of the cross or whatever context you want to put it in. He's gone through everything to become sort of give blood out at the end of the show and say, that's it, I'm in. His commitment to the rebellion and to fight the empire and to dedicate his life to that. We're not going to put that in doubt now. Going forward, we have a whole bunch of new issues that we're going to deal with. But that final line was on the table before many other things were worked up. So what I found interesting about what Tony Gilroy was saying and what was very apparent to me watching Andor season one was just how much it harked back to a lot of human history. And anyone that has any working knowledge of what does it mean to rebel or fight out against whatever oppressor, I mean, so much of human history is just that in many myriad forms. And, you know, I said on the John Campy show the other day that, that 12th, the 12th episode when you have the band playing, I mean, it reminded me of a of, of funeral procession in New Orleans, what is it? It's called the, not the third rail. It's something like that. The uh, some, I forget the name of it, but you know, I, I always love going to New Orleans because you never know when a band's going to turn the corner playing some mournful tune and it might be someone's funeral or it might be a jazz band playing some Dixieland at three in the morning. You never know. But it also reminded me of Les Mis. You know, it reminded me of a bunch of different things that I've seen throughout my life. And it was clearly supposed to. And all the way through Andor, you know, I, I saw a lot of, obviously, the prison, THX 1138, you know, and, and uh, an homage to George Lucas's THX 1138. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on in that, uh, that show that I found fascinating on many different levels. And it was kind of perplexing to me when I started seeing the very different reactions people were having to Andor about its pacing being slow. And I've said, I've joked before, if you think that's slow, watch Tarkovsky's movie Stalker, which is based on the Russian science fiction novel Roadside Picnic by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. <laughs> <That's t> <laughs> Look, I love Stalker, but it's a, it's a slog. It's a tough one. It's hard. It's hard to do. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. But um, I, I was, I, I mean, here's the thing that struck me about Andor that I thought was readily apparent to any Star Wars fan. One of the things that we haven't have seen, especially in the Star Wars movies, was what exactly was the problem with the Empire? 
I mean, obviously, we've seen the people fighting against it. We've seen rebels, animated rebels. We've seen Jedi Knights. We've seen people, but but where? What was the Empire? I mean, honestly, why was it bad? And in the prequel trilogy, you see people cheering for Palpatine coming to power and turning the Republic into an Empire. You know, I've seen Gladiator. Do you believe in the Republic? You know, or do you believe in a Caesar coming? I mean, what do you believe in, Maximus? I, I get all that. I understand that. And what I've never seen is how did the Empire affect um, the normal everyday person? Why was the Empire something to be crushed? And what Andor did, I think, and brilliantly did, was it showed us what the workaday Empire and what the, what the workaday nature of the rebellion was going to be. You know, Ferrex to me is a, it's a steel town in Pennsylvania 50 years ago or 60 years ago or 70 years ago, whatever. A workaday, blue collar. And what if the government had marched in there and started telling people how to live their lives? You know, and what if that empire had taken over the rest of the world? But how would a steel town in Pittsburgh or in Pennsylvania react? Well, that's what Andor gave us. And I was fascinated by it. I, I loved it. And I could see everything that Tony Gilroy was doing. And I'm like, this show is so smart, the way it's bouncing around and showing us how this would happen. And at the same time, it takes a character, a secondary character, not even Jyn Erso. It's taking Cassian Andor and it's showing what a guy who's basically just trying to survive, who is not beyond putting a bullet in someone's head. He will rock and roll if his interests are um, somehow not conducive to what's what's going on i mean he'll he but he still doesn't really believe in anything he's just trying to survive no matter who gets in his way and find his sister and all that well how does a guy like that come to believe in a cause this is classic literature these kinds of stories have been told for thousands of years and and this is not this is not anything new but i found that that even the first star wars was influenced so many influences of the original Star Wars. And I remember, you know, after reading George Lucas talking about where those sources came from. I mean, if you go to Wikipedia, and uh, I, I encourage all of you to just uh, punch in Star Wars sources and analogs. I mean, you, you see the crawl from Flash Gordon serials. There's a picture of the crawl. It's right out of, you know, Star Wars. Obviously, everybody, you all know that George Lucas wanted to make a Flash Gordon movie but couldn't get the rights, right? Um, but just, just here in this first paragraph, the Star Wars science fiction media franchise is acknowledged to have been inspired by many sources. These include Southern East and Asian religions, philosophy, classic mythology, Roman history, Gnosticism, Zoroastrianism, parts of the Abrahamic religions, Confucianism, Shinto and Taoism. Creator George Lucas stated most of the spiritual reality in the movie is based on a synthesis of all religions, a synthesis through history the way man has perceived the unknown and the great mystery and tried to deal with that or dealing with it. Lucas has also said that chivalry, knighthood, paladinism, and related institutions and feudal societies inspired some of the concepts in the Star Wars movie, most notably the Jedi Knights. The work of mythologist Joseph Campbell, especially his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, directly influenced Lucas, and this is what drove him to create the modern myth of Star Wars. The natural flow of energy known as the Force is believed to have originated from the concept of Kwaichiki, the all-pervading vital energy of the universe. Um, and then it goes on, and it even talks about uh, science fiction writer E.E. E. Doc Smith. His writings, which I actually went back and read when I was a kid, because I had read this before, his writings contained elements central to the Star Wars universe, and these elements include spherical moon-sized spaceships, smaller spherical jetless fighters with accumulators for beamed power. The space hounds of the IPC includes light swords of slicing blade of flame and planes of force wielded by spherical ships, also attested in melee combat. E.E. E. Doc Smith's lensmen have the telepathic powers of the Jedi derived from crystalline lenses mirroring kyber crystals in Star Wars. In Triplanetary, a tractor beam from an artificial planetoid captures another vessel and a damsel in distress adventure ensues. Space armor with a general focus on melee combat using space axes, which they also use in the anime series Legends of the Galactic Heroes, which owes a lot to lensmen. Uh, a golden meteor is the emblem and insignia of the galactic protectors, a galactic trade in drugs which are used as currency. 
a galactic core of heroes with telepathic powers. Note Lensman was written 10 years before the Silver Age edition of Green Lantern. Benevolent guardians seeking to fight evil. Unseen enemies seeking galactic domination. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. All of these things are in Star Wars. I don't feel, and and one of the great things about Star Wars when I was young, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, was going back and digging into where where George Lucas, that's where I first read E.E. Doc Smith, um, was because I'd read that there was stuff from Lensman, and there's a whole, it's a whole, again, it's an IP. Surprised no one's delved into it, but it's because Star Wars already did it first. But the point is, is there's a lot to love in Star Wars, but you'd love it more if you had a broad base of knowledge of what's going on. And that's why the response to Andor has been incredibly frustrating to me as a lifelong fan and certainly a fan of Star Wars since that fateful weekend. I did not see Star Wars on May 25th. I saw Star Wars on the following Sunday. If it opened, if May 25th was a Wednesday, I saw it on, on there was Thursday, Friday. I, I first tried to get into it on Friday. Lines, never seen them before. Didn't get in. Went on Sunday. So I saw it four days after that. So probably the 29th, maybe, of May. But anyway, Star Wars began a lifelong thirst for a knowledge of where all of this stuff came from. And I would have thought that would have happened to everybody. Now, this is not a criticism of fandom, but I do feel that the discourse in fandom has become far less interesting than it used to be. Because I don't see, I mean, now, obviously, Star Wars has animation, it has video games. And and I think that everybody's knowledge of Star Wars today is based on their institutional knowledge of Star Wars itself. There's so much Star Wars to know that the influences of where Star Wars came from have sort of been forgotten by Star Wars fans. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I am not here to point my fingers at fandom because I've been a fan my whole life and I'm accused of being a gatekeeper enough. But I do think that fans owe it to themselves. The more you know about the influences of where all this stuff came from, the deeper of your enjoyment I think it will be. You'll get more enjoyment out of it. And you'll you'll be able to make connections. You'll find things you might not have ever thought you'd found or things that might not have ever interested you, but you'll see them and read about them and suddenly you're, you know, it's a whole new world, you know, and you will find your way to classic novels. You will find your way to, I, I, I never heard Beethoven before. I'd never heard Beethoven until after I started listening to Star Wars. You know, I asked my mom about, um, is there any other music like this? And and she, I mean, to her, it was all classical music. She's like, well, I have my Beethoven records. And, you know, she had all, all of Beethoven's works. You know, and I started listening to Beethoven's symphonies. And what was really interesting is after I heard, like, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, I started recognizing it, recognizing it in a lot of movies especially science fiction movies. I was like, oh, you know, and I was reading Lord of the Rings as well. And then you'd heard about the Ring of the Nibelung cycle and all of that and, and Norse mythology and what Wagner had done and all of that. What is, what is that? You know, and then in 81 Excalibur came out and was using some of Wagner's music and it leads you to, you know, you go find these things and you just keep, and what's so great is and it's endless. You can dig into all this endlessly. It's an endless font of knowledge that you will never, ever, all you're going to do is gain appreciation for all this stuff, especially a show like Andor. So when I hear fandom saying, you know, Rob, this is slow, it's boring, it's not the Star Wars I want, and I'm like, the, for me, it was the opposite. I had the opposite experience. This was the Star Wars that I was always interested in, but I didn't think anyone was ever going to tell that story, and yet we got it from Tony Gilroy. So, and and I think anybody with a cursory understanding of writing, um, Andor is a very literary show. And what I mean that, what I mean by that, it, 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 like, look, all science fiction comes, your enjoyment of science fiction, whether it's comics, video games, movies, or whatever, would be greatly enhanced by reading, I mean, reading some of the great, canonical works of science fiction now i'm not saying you have to 
I'm not saying you're less of a fan if you don't. I'm just saying that if you did yourself a favor and delved into these works, like for instance, Dune. I know you've seen the movie, but the book Dune is fascinating. It's fascinating to read because, again, Frank Herbert was drawing on much of the real world, our world, to create that universe, to create everything in the Landsrad, the fact that it takes place in the year 10,191, the, the Butlerian Jihad, all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, we're getting a TV show based on the formation of the Bene Gesserit that takes place 10,000 years before the Dune movie. Who would have thought anybody would do that? But HBO Max is. Did you know that? I mean, isn't that crazy? We're getting the Sisterhood TV show. We're getting a show about the formation of the Bene Gesserit that takes place 10,000 years before Dune. Where's Where's the Knights of the Old Republic show? Where's that? Come on, man. Why aren't we doing... I don't understand. I mean, I, I mean, I do. I understand corporate interests and IP and all that. But you know what? Here's what I would say. When something like Andor comes along, we as fans owe it to ourselves to embrace something that tries to do something new that is ob like obviously if you don't like Andor and you think it's slow I think it's clear uh, I don't believe in the subjectivity of all art I believe in the subjectivity of people's opinions not everybody has to like everything people like people have all kinds of different tastes they like all kinds of different things but that doesn't mean that Andor isn't good <laughs> that doesn't mean the Mona Lisa is a bad painting I believe that art, great art, has objectively great things about it. And you know who decides this? History. History does. If art survives history and it keeps having truths and things that can be passed down to new, new generations, then there is objectively something in art that's touching not just you or not just us, but touching multiple generations. I think I agree, you know. Well, I think it was Theodore Sturgeon who said 90% uh, of everything is crap? Was it Ted, Ted Sturgeon? Was that Sturgeon's Law? I don't remember. If I'm wrong, put it down in the comments. But, um, you know, I, I look at Andor did for Star Wars what Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica remake did for the original Battlestar Galactica. It took the core concepts that were there and showed us them in ways we had never seen before and made them much more adult, and made them more relevant. I mean, like all great stories, allegorically, Andor has a lot to say about what's going on in our world today. As you heard from Tony Gilroy, there's plenty of places around the world that you can find real Cassian Andors or real Luthans. And wouldn't you rather know about this stuff and have a background of knowledge that you can watch a show like Andor and go, oh... I see, that reminds me of this, or, I, oh, yeah, I read that, or something like that. And I feel like that our our fandom has become increasingly myopic. And all I would say to anybody who's a fan of science fiction, fantasy, or horror, genre fiction, or genre movies, or genre comics, or genre video games, even like The Last of Us, there's so much out there in the real world to experience, and to learn about that will enhance your knowledge, your love, and understanding of the things you love that are completely made up, like the Star Wars universe. And I would say that I think that we need, as fans, especially with one another, elevate that discourse, you know? And and wouldn't it be interesting if you could see, like, I, I, I uh, you know, I was mentioning Les Mis, that Les Mis, it remind, if you haven't seen Les Miserables, there is a movie version of it. You can watch that. But but I think that having this basic pop culture understanding that I think is being is very elusive now. And I, I find it sort of strange. I mean, people are actively not going back and watching things or listening to things. That's why or maybe it's a generational thing, but I, that's why I love seeing like Gen Z having reaction videos. You know, it gives me when people are saying, like, oh, this was good. I really like this. Um you know, going back and getting that knowledge and finding out where all these creators are drawing from will just enhance everyone's understanding and I think appreciation for what we're getting. And when I see a show like Andor and there's all these think pieces about how no one's watching it, look, it is amazing to me. Within uh, Disney, the hallowed halls of Disney, that that show even got made. I can't believe someone allowed that show to get made. And of course, on its surface, it's the ultimate Star Wars show. It is literally showing you 
the beginnings of the rebellion, and at the same time, it's showing you the inner workings, the workaday workings of the Empire. Two things we've never seen in Star Wars. And it's fascinating. For that alone, the show should be lauded, and people should embrace it. Look, and I'll be selfish. I'm, I'll, I'm selfish. I want to see more Star Wars like this. Does that mean that I don't want to see more Jedi Knights and the swashbuckling sci-fi fantasy adventure? No, I love all that too. I love it. But not everything has to have that. That's why I'm looking forward to Mandalorian. I mean, Mandalorian is the Boba Fett show we were supposed to get, and it's a continuation of the Clone Wars and Rebels animated series. I mean, who would have thought we'd get that too? So, But imagine the counterpoint. I mean, I'm looking forward to the Acolyte series because knowing that we can get a show like Andor uh, gives me hope. And I'm really looking forward to what we're, what we're having done with, with Star Wars because, look, the difference between Star Wars that we've been getting theatrically and Andor is that they gave Andor to somebody and trusted that that person, they're like, okay, Tony Gilroy, you know, you saved Rogue One for us. We made a billion dollars. You go do the show. And remember, his brother Dan and his brother John all worked on the show. Dan is a writer, John is an editor, and Tony Gilroy together. We got an auteurist vision of what Star Wars could be. I want more of that. I don't want somebody, I don't want Disney to mandate, well, you know, you need to, you can't just put Luke Skywalker and Han and Leia and Chewie and R2 and 3PO and you can't just do that. We got to create new characters that, that are our characters. Got to change all that. How'd that work out for you? You know, anyway, just some thoughts, just some thoughts about fandom. It's everybody out there, this big world out there. And um, you know what? The more you know about where all this shit came from, I think the better that you'll, you'll appreciate it more and you'll just have more fun in life. <laughs> I'm telling you, you will because you'll be interested in so many more things. You'll be like, ah, you know what? I, I want to go check that out. Let's go over there. Let's go to that museum. Let's read that book. Let's listen to that music. So what if it's 1,600 years old? Let's, you know, let's, let's read some of that. I'm going to read Gilgamesh. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, uh, there's a couple of other things that uh, I wanted to get into, but I realized this is the only point I wanted to make on this Thanksgiving day about Andor, about fandom. Share a little bit my, about myself. I'm just, I'm really happy that we live in this. And I, by the way, a little editorialization here. I'd say the same thing holds true with Wakanda Forever. I thought Wakanda Forever um, was a wildly, I've said it before, wildly ambitious. Hey, it might not be the Black Panther movie everybody wanted, but boy, is it a Black Panther movie that I think we needed. So um, fascinating stuff. Anyway, a lot of people have been firing in uh, some super chats here. Let me uh, first start out uh, with tips. Um Uh, Pete Yacovoni says, actually, this came, um, from, uh, Pete, uh, he sent a letter to Let's Get Physical Media. I'm going to save your, your tip, Pete, till uh, this weekend. Me Panties. <laughs> Me Panties is a proud new sponsor. We sell specifically designed panties for men who want to look good and feel sexy. Next time you see Rob, make sure you ask him about Me Panties. We sent him a box full, so he'll be wearing a pair. Bring on the tassels. Well, me panties, I'll wear your panties. I'm manscaped too, so they better be soft. Stubble McShave, by the way, thank you, Stubble. Stubble McShave sent me a book. All I need to know about the Wheel of Time. I uh, got that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Stubble McShave says, there's too much stuff coming nowadays. You don't have time to nerd out about things. I'm going to make a conscious decision to ignore some IPs and focus more on the things that appeal the most to me. I want to fan out on some of the new material as well you should. I think that's um I think that's amazing. You should do that. Uh our friend Sonny Dominguez sends in a tip. The king of squirting. Uh Sonny says happy Thanksgiving post geek singularity. Careful uh grateful for the Facebook group to share thoughts that evolve into conversations and even friendships. There have been some odd spammers posting fake deaths by the way. May our season be filled with heavenly squirts. And continued imagination. Well, Sonny, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, I think that's amazing. Um, 
so yeah, that you can you, you there's a tip feature. There's a link down below if you want to use that. And then of course there are super chats, and I need to get to those too. Bert Bert says, "I like the new Spike Terran beard look. You own it." Well, to be fair, uh, before I uh, started the show, I took a shower, put a little product in my hair. Normally, I you know run it uh, run my hands through my hair. This is more Gordon Gecko or uh, Pat Riley. But uh, just know when I finish the show, I'll comb it out and it'll be much more. But thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Joe Trash FX sends in the super chat and says you talked about what makes great trek i judge it by asking if i would like to spend time in their world or with the characters i would not like to live in the bleak world of picard season one or two or disco <laughs> i i grant you that but i'll tell you one thing i bet you're gonna want to live in uh, the world of picard season three i mean let's face it is it is it's it, it has a big there's a big threat it's not a universal ending threat but it's a threat but it's a lot of fun, and the characters are a lot of fun. And uh, Star Trek Picard Season 3 is like one 10-hour-long Star Trek movie. Alex Detman sends in a $50 super chat. Alex, you're too kind. Uh, Alex says, I am grateful for this kick-ass community, for being able to hang out with our Admiral of Access and Knowledge to film Robert Meyer Burnett. Thank you for being an awesome friend to us all. Well, that's very nice. I'm grateful for finally feeling I belong. Well, Alex, of course you belong. You absolutely belong. We all belong here. If you're an imagination connoisseur, you are welcome here. And by the way, by the way, I would say this. Uh, as people know, we are we are going to run a short story competition. We are going to start that short story competition again. I'm going to announce it in early December. And entries open again in on February 15th. So I'm going to give people a chance to write. If you've already sent your uh story in no problem uh i have a professional editor that's starting work on and we we are going to charge a rather steep entry fee because i'm now paying uh an editor to read the stories and actually who's going to edit the stories with us um but um we are going to publish the book in 2023 and then yes for those of people who ask well when are you going to give out the awards for the film festival i'm not giving out the awards for the film festival yet i'm going to and there are cash prizes the book is going to be different. The book is going to have, and we're going to crowdfund the final book because it's going to be in digital form. It's going to be in paperback form, and it's, I'm going to make a um, a beautiful hardcover slipcase version of the book. And there are some professional writers who are going to make some contributions as well, but notices of that will come later. So the book is called The Imagination Connoisseurs, and the short stories will be between 5,000 and 10,000 words. And you can write anything you want. You can write a story that should appeal to imagination connoisseurs. You can write a story about being an imagination connoisseur. You can write an essay. I, I leave it totally open. It is going to be an anthology of stories or essays, whatever you choose to write, about what does it mean or what is an imagination connoisseur. So uh, Sam Sugart says, I just saw Glass Onion fan freaking tastic. I'm probably going to go see that tomorrow. I cannot wait. I'm really excited. Um, uh, it looks great. I'm going to go see Glass Onion, and I was supposed to go see. I'm just. I think I'm going to go to Glass Onion and the menu. See a double feature. Happy Thanksgiving, Rob. Thank you for getting me through training with the Marines. Wow. Well, congratulations, Semper Fi. Hoorah. Uh, your insights always keep me sharp and informed. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I appreciate that very much, Zachary. Um, and thank you in advance for your service. And uh, keep us abreast. I'd be very curious. You know what I would be interested for you to do? Maybe we could do something with it on the channel. Keep just a little diary, even if you just talk into your phone or something, uh, about your experience, about becoming a Marine. What does it mean to become a Marine in 2022, 2023? I'd be very curious to hear about your journey. And, um, you know, if you think about it, I mean, I don't, you probably can't take pictures or anything, but just your thoughts could be really interesting. Uh, Bond Presents says, I agree exploration into a piece's inspiration and origins and time period is a missing part of today's fandom. Great works reward research. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, and I, I love that. Our friend Mike Alito <laughs> says, Sokath his eyes uncovered. Love you. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, Mikey, I love you too. By the way, uh, our own uh, Mikey Alito here, uh, has an aunt 
And if you want to watch a documentary, a fascinating story about a fascinating individual who really shaped the United States without people really knowing it, uh, watch the documentary, My Name is Polly Murray. And you know what? This weekend is a perfect time to watch that documentary. And uh, it's fascinating. So you never know. People that are imagination connoisseurs or people that are adjacent to imagination connoisseurs, a lot of people have really interesting people in their lives. Um, and that's that's another thing. When you, when you, when you uh, watch this documentary, it's a fascinating documentary, but I'll tell you something. I didn't know who Polly Murray was. And I was listening to a um, author on NPR a couple weeks back, maybe a month ago or something. I told Mikey about this. And the author was talking about Polly Murray and her contributions to law in the United States. And I was like, I know who Polly Murray is. And um, I wish I could remember the name of the book. Mikey probably knows. It, put it in the chat. But you know what's really funny? If you guys haven't seen Alex Cox's mid-80s, I think it's 84, his movie Repo Man. There's an actor named Lori Walter who's in this movie. And in Repo Man, he's, he's explaining. He's like, you know, you know, like sometimes when somebody mentions something like shrimp or plate of shrimp, like suddenly you'll realize that there's, you'll see it everywhere. You'll hear it everywhere. It's all around you. Plate of shrimp. People talking about plates and shrimps. It's part of the part of the mysteries of the universe and it's true it's like it's like when you pick a, a new word to use every day suddenly that word pops up you realize oh my god this word's everywhere i just didn't notice it before because you let it pass by you um so mikey thanks for that but uh definitely you're going to want to watch um my name is Polly murray uh joseph michael who's a pgs hero member uh says with bob Iger back at the helm would you say the chances of pixar's elemental Remaining a theatrical release have gone up. Uh, happy thank, happy thanks, happy give thanksing, <laughs> Joseph. I think absolutely. I I think that first of all, Elemental looks wonderful, and I think absolutely will Pixar, uh, Pixar movies be theatrical. I mean, I can't imagine them not being theatrical. Uh, so yes, uh, Elon Abadi uh, is here and said. So so it's happy early Hanukkah. Well, thank you. Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. Next year in Jerusalem. That's what we'll do. Um, Paul in Long Beach, our friend Paul in Long Beach, is talking about Andor and says, every episode is an is an acting masterclass, Rob. Diego Luna, Skarsgård, Circus, Whitaker, and now Fiona Shaw. All the side characters are a well are as well and deserve a round of applause for their efforts. Those who didn't appreciate the show, I get it. But you're wrong. <laughs> it's true. I think so too. But you know what? Here's the thing. I'm never going to tell somebody they're right or wrong for liking or not liking something. I don't think that's fair because everybody has different tastes. What I will say is that the more that you know about something, the more that I think that your level of appreciation increases. And, um, and I think that that's always a good thing. So I would say that. Uh, Darth Plato, our friend Darth Plato says, who knows a lot about history, says, I couldn't agree more about wanting to know where things come from. And I don't just mean Star Wars, but I certainly did feel that with Star Wars. I call it the genealogy of ideas. Ooh, I love that. But this presupposes an appreciation from literature. Look, I agree. I, I, I think, you know, when I was growing up, the term reading is fundamental all of our storytelling is literary based. I mean, yeah, we used to tell people stories around the campfire, but all of our great stories are an evolution of of literature as literature was passed along through the ages. And by the way, if anybody tells you that you shouldn't be reading authors anymore because they've fallen out of favor, I'm like, fuck that. You know, um, human civilization evolved. And if you're going to hold thousands and thousands of years of human civilization against uh, you're educating yourself. You're doing your only yourself a disservice. Um, so there you go. That is that is my thought. Um, oh, by the way, my nephew is waiting patiently to know what you thought of your package, brother. You know what? I totally forgot to bring that down. Wait. You will we only have to wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, you will find out tomorrow. 
what I thought of your package. Uh, so tell your nephew tomorrow. I'm going to do a Rob observations tomorrow about something totally different. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, Rob, happy Thanksgiving to you and Elizabeth. We got friends from out of town. We got family here. It's going to be great. And um, non-corrupt TV producer. <laughs> I love that. Uh, sends in a tip and says, hey, Rob, how you doing? Love the holiday look. Santa Claus really works for you. <laughs> anyway, you didn't very much like the first two seasons of my show. I have a third coming out, and I need a good from a good review from you. Is this enough? Let's do lunch. No. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Uh, look, I'll watch your third season. If it's good, I'll be able to say it's good. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people, I, I assume you're referring to my love of the Terry Metalis show run Picard season three. All I can tell you about Picard season three is... Don't take, don't take your Uncle Bob's advice. All right, don't take my lifelong love of Star Trek, uh, my my both professional and personal interest in the franchise. Don't listen to me. Don't, don't listen to anybody. You should always make up your own mind. You can you can take it under advisement, but I would say this: if you and I know Louise, you know Louise. I love you, Louise Expero. She's in the chat. I love her to death. She's great. Um, I'm sure we'd be we we could go to the, throw back a few pints and have a good time. But Louise, the damage the damage can always be fixed. It's all I'm just telling you. Here's all I ask everybody that thinks that Picard they've been burned so and look nobody hates modern Star Trek more than me. I even hate Strange New Worlds. All right, for various other reasons. Strange New Worlds, what a pandering show that is, um, and what they did to Balance of Terror, complete misunderstanding of of uh, uh, oh. My God, don't get me started. I hate modern Star Trek. I hate it. I think it is absolutely creatively bankrupt. I think the people that are making it don't really care very much about the Star Trek franchise. Hey, it's a job. Good for you. The actors do the best they can. I wonder if they know their ranks. Maybe they don't. I don't know. I hate modern Star Trek. Really loved Star Trek Picard Season 3. And I hated Picard Seasons 1 and 2. And I'll tell you this. There is a scene, and I'm not even going to tell you what the scene is. There's a scene involving a bunk bed. If you get to the scene in episode one with the bunk bed, it'll put a smile on your face and you'll be locked in. Give me the bunk bed. Get to the bunk bed in the first episode, which probably happens around the 30, 40 minute mark. If you get to the bunk bed, it's not even a big scene, but it's just a, it's a, just put a little wry smile on your face. If you get to that scene, you'll be in. That's all I'll say. I won't. I won't twist your arm anymore. I swear to God. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do though. I think I'm going to read um, a letter. I got some letters. I got some good letters. As you know, if you want to write me letters, you can. Um, you can write me letters here. At, go to the the right down below the post geek singularity, and uh, I read them. I read them live on the show, and I'm going to read one. Now, now here's here's a couple good ones. William La Rochelle writes in, "Click versus appeal." Uh oh, I probably have to take a swig of water for this one. Here's hoping that this gets through the filter. In the clickbait era, it is clearly an accurate observation that trolling fans has replaced marketing. In 2015, I'd been thinking Lucasfilm and Marvel could save a lot of Madison Avenue money hyping those films because the fan bases get a lot of awareness from social media for free. But the core problem might be the false belief that wokesters represent the audience today. It is executives who have to shun that. One of the first Indiana Jones images leaked or released showed Kathleen Kennedy. James Mangold is wasting valuable time arguing with what he calls basement dwellers, including a center of the earth dweller. What good comes from millionaires punching down at the core fan base? I like James Mangold's direction, so I like stories of he and Kathleen Kennedy at odds. You may like and defend Kathleen Kennedy, I do, and she no doubt, uh, no doubt she has friends, she does, I respect that she has influence, but we don't know the division of labor between Kathleen Kennedy, her husband, and other Ambul Amblin executives over the years. Currently, we figure funding comes from one place, Disney, so raising money is not one of Kathleen Kennedy's chores. It was never one of Kathleen Kennedy's chores. Maybe all fans can do is give our two cents or feedback from the market, apart 
from a few vulgar outliers who may be kids, there is no such thing as a toxic fan any more than someone who doesn't like the way a restaurant meal takes tastes is a toxic eater. When people ask whether a movie studio or creator owes the fans anything, I wonder why in the hell entertainment f- providers would not want to give the people what they believe they're paying for. Trojan horsing is a misguided move. Brand appropriation erodes any trust in that brand. I'll go so far as to say that a movie patron should not even have to be a good person to get the entertainment they paid for. Totally agree with that. We all can agree that racism is wrong, but then someone extends the definition so that if you are not a white abolitionist, you are part of the problem. (laughs) I agree with that too. (laughs) <laughs> that would require the audience and people understanding what an abolitionist even was. Uh, Ryan Johnson can do as he likes with his creation, like Glass Onion, where he is not subverting an iconic character who previously existed and tacking on a trait, so I have no issue with Benoit Blanc's personal life, even if others appear to. I don't either. Layers of the onion get gradually peeled and core fans inevitably learn how the sausage is made and what was crammed in there and by whom. I appreciated the Duel of the Fates summaries. Uh, Thank you, by the way. That was, I was one of the first people because somebody slipped me the script. They wanted me to get it out into the world. I'm not going to say who or why or what, but they did. And I was the first person to report on that. That was Colin Trevorrow's third Duel of the Fates script. And here's the thing. There was a plan for the Disney Star Wars trilogy. It was very apparent in that Duel of the Fates script. It was going to be J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, and Colin Trevorrow making those movies. There was a number of things, one of them, one of the biggest being the death of Carrie Fisher, that derailed those plans. And and unfortunately, we ended up getting the god-awful Rise of Skywalker, which is one of the worst science fiction movies and science fiction fantasy movies ever made. Um... Layers of the onion gradually get peeled and core fans inevitably learn how the sausage is made and what was crammed in there and by whom. I appreciated the Duel of Fate summaries, but I think I'm allergic to hype and even enthusiasm lately. Kathleen Kennedy telling Michael Arndt that Luke Skywalker was distracting from the new characters in Star Wars caused a lot of dominoes dominoes to fall. One positive about the pandemic was putting on older discs of movies and TV shows I had not watched in a while and finding them less constrained. Hollywood can disregard, quote, woke sensibilities. Well, here's, uh, thank you, by the way, for that uh, letter, sir, William uh, LaRochelle. Here's my thing about all of this. What I don't understand is we are on a good path (laughs) in terms of inclusion and and in terms of uh, everybody getting a voice. There was, we were. We've been completely derailed. All of that has been derailed. And, you know, we, we are, we're now, what do I always say on the show? You can't trade one oppression for another. Oh, but we are, we are, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different craziness happening and it's, it's, it's really too bad. I mean, it's, it's kind of a bummer and everybody, I mean, uh, I think everybody's becoming a self-centered asshole in my mind. I mean, rather than look inward why does everybody expect the world to revolve around them? Where did that come from? You need to, the world needs to be the way I want it to be. You all need to talk to me the way I want to be talked. It's like, fuck that. That's, you know what? Even I, as a kid, understood when I opened the door to my house and I walked outside, I could not expect the world to be the way I liked it. <laughs> the world was out there, man, and it was going to get me. And all I needed, I didn't have plot armor, but I needed to be strong enough and smart enough to know how I'm going to navigate the world out there and to realize there's all different kinds of people from all walks of life, different shapes, sizes, colors, creeds, sexualities. They're all different for me. And I needed to go out there and understand them. Now, that doesn't mean I have to do exactly what they say that I should do, but I have to understand them. And hopefully learn to live with or or be be friends with or understand comprehend who those people were learning about people it's the same thing to learn about influences of george lucas when he made star wars try and understand people you know be polite understand that every single human being on this planet is the only person they're the only in the entire universe in the infinity of the universe most stars are made up of the same shit now 
there's not a lot of diversity in stars. Stars are, I mean, there's big stars, there's small stars, hot stars, cooler stars, but people are wildly diverse. There's probably a lot more diversity in humanity than there are in the diversity of the kind of stars there are in the universe, and yet we're all made up of, as Carl Sagan would say, star stuff. But, you know, I mean, but now people demand that the world cater to them, which is strange to me. Why, why, like, I'm, hey, I'm all about, if you want to call yourself whatever, I'll call you whatever you want. But don't, I'm polite, but don't demand that I do it. Don't, if I disagree, understand that I disagree with something you're saying to me. And don't, don't make me, don't force me to do something I disagree with. You know, especially if it, if it's not compelled by law. And I think that's, that's, we need to be much more mindful of one another. I mean, our different opinions and different ideas are where we should meet, where we should explore, where we should cooperate and find out who's, you know, let's, let's be greater than the sum of our parts. Let's like together do something new. Let's create something new, not subvert everything that's already here. Um, all that you can do that too. Um, Let's see. This one comes from, oh, there's a good one. Mark Erickson says, limited runs. Um, so okay, before I read this, I have to explain that XO6, which is a new company, a new Star Trek licensee, their only product is making high-end, sixth-scale Star Trek figures. And they, um, you pre-order them. And I have to say, of all the six-scale companies, you order them, and usually you get them within three months, which is pretty great. Well, recently they have done uh, a Star Trek, the motion picture, Admiral Kirk. They did a very limited run, and it sold out within the first day it was available. So this letter comes from Mark Erickson. What is the upside for XO6 limiting its Admiral Kirk figure to a low production number, which, as you pointed out, sold out in seven minutes? It sold out on the on the XO6 website, but you could still get it at Sideshow, but it's gone now. It's as if they're leaving money on the table. Thanks for your sharing and deep knowledge on a wide variety of topics. Best of luck to you in your endeavors, and I would happily contribute to a fund for an update of Free Enterprise. Yeah, I heard some bad news on that front, which I'll talk about on a later date, but... We're still working on it. Um, well, Mark, look, I agree with you. But here's the thing about a company like X06. It's a small company. And they have to, based on their market knowledge, they have to manufacture what they think will sell. I think they were surprised that it sold out um, so quickly. Other, other figures are manufactured based on how many orders they get. But with Star Trek The Motion Picture, the limited run thing, I'm sure they had reasons for it but they would rather sell out of that limited run than have stock on hand. So I can understand. I mean, he says, the, the head of the company says he's not going to make more, but you never know. But then again, if he, he he's kind of locked into, like when you manufacture these things, you can't just manufacture like 10 or 20. You have to manufacture like a run of 1,000 to make it cost effective. So he might have only decided, okay, I'm only going to make 1,000 of these. And he was probably surprised by uh, the interest, because I'll, I'll bet you money that he um, uh, that he didn't sell out of the Star Trek Discovery figures. So he wants to make sure that you know he doesn't uh, get stuck with them. But I understand. I mean, it's it's a tough call. But he did announce. He also made a big deal to say this is going to be a very limited run, and once they're gone, they're gone. And uh, he'll make other figures. You know, tomorrow he's going to drop Quark. So we'll see if that sells out. Um, let's see. Um, um, Al Alana Ab uh, Abadi says, have you watched Slugfest? It's pretty good. Short and interesting episode episodes about the comic book industry's history. Uh, Kevin Smith narrates, uh, Russo Brothers produced. I have not, but I know the book. I think it's based on the book, which I read. Uh, I think it's called Slugfest, isn't it? About the history of Marvel and DC. I, I, I do want to watch it. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, Manuel Shaper says, or Manuel Shaper says, did you notice the lens distortion in Andor? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, I think they probably, you might be talking about the fact that they used anamorphic lenses to shoot it, of which um, 
that you know there's a great if you guys don't know the YouTube channel Studio Binder. Studio Binder is a product. They're selling a product, but they do great videos about different things in filmmaking. And they did a pretty great video about anamorphic lenses that explain and they'll it gives you a little primer of how to understand and how to recognize what was shot with anamorphic lenses and what wasn't. And then there's another guy and I forget his name who has an, a, a channel about where he talks about anamorphic stuff and if you let that studio binder thing play then then he'll come on I think if it'll suggest and he'll come on and go that studio binder thing took a lot from me and those two things together are um really informative when it comes to anamorphic lenses but you might be talking about that if I I get you correct um Esteban Rivera Says, hey, Rob, my favorite director is Mel Gibson, and my favorite movie of his is The Patriot. But he didn't direct The Patriot. Wolfgang, I mean, um, um, uh, Roland Emmerich directed The Patriot. Uh, hey, Rob, my favorite director is Mel Gibson. My favorite movie of his is The Patriot. I used to watch it with my dad every year during the holidays. Weird, since a holiday choice, uh, weird holiday choice, I know. Do you have a weird movie choice for the holidays? Yes. Shawshank Redemption. And I'll tell you why. Um, because every year at Christmas, being the good Jew that I am, uh, we didn't really celebrate Christmas, obviously. And uh, uh, December 25th was Jewish movie day in my house. And my parents and I, we would always, and my sister, we'd always go to a movie. And there were two times in my life where there were actually big Jewish movies on Jewish movie day. One was Yentl. And I'm like, fuck that, I'm not going. <laughs> I mean... Barbara Streisand could walked on water for 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 Jewish men of my father's generation. I mean, she was like the sex goddess of all time. Was was Barbara Streisand, but I was not a big fan of hers. I, I mean, I like her now, but I, I, there's no way I'm going to go see Yentl on for Jewish movie day. So I went skiing instead. I went to I went up to Crystal Mountain. Um, but then we got Schindler's List which was the ultimate Jewish movie on Jewish movie day. So that was fantastic. So, but my favorite movie for the holidays is the Shawshank Redemption because I used to read the story that was in different seasons that came out in 1982, the Stephen King book. Uh, different seasons had four novellas in it. It had uh, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. That was the name of the original story. It had Apt Pupil. It had The Body, which was later turned into Stand By Me. And then it had another story that's never been adapted called The Breathing Method. And I read um, um, I read the Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption because it's it was like 100 pages in the hardcover. And for whatever reason, I, I love that story so much. And then when the movie came out in, what, 94? I love the movie. I think the movie's one of the great um, um, adaptations of all time. And um, I I love it. I was watching the 4K just the other night, and the 4K looks so good. Um, so yeah, which is which is um. So that's yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, but Mel Gibson, I mean, as a director, you know, uh, I, he's a great director. I mean, Braveheart, Passion of the Christ. Say what you want about Passion of the Christ; it's really well directed. I think though that my favorite Mel Gibson movie might be Apocalypto. If you haven't seen Apocalypto, you should see it. It's great. Hassan Chavez says, Andor won me over in the end. Well, Hassan, that's that's good. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, Richard says, Richard sends in a tip and says, isn't the whole point of Indiana Jones that he's a character who dislikes all the adventuring, tomb raiding, and femme fatales? It's just a means to an end for his real passion, the academia. Ironically, the character would retire as soon as possible. Um, mm, I don't know if that's true or not. Could you say that? I don't know. Um, look, I think that somebody who's as good, I think Indiana Jones does like the adventuring. When he says, you know, it's not the... It's the mileage, you know, it's not the age, it's the mileage or whatever in Raiders. I think he likes it. I think he likes academia too. I think the guy like so many, I mean, like for me, I like making movies. I like talking about movies. I like watching movies. I think archaeology is in his blood. And while he might not 
want to do these things. I think he has to do these things. He's compelled. Indiana Jones is the, is the guy, you know, he wants to see these things and he wants to experience them. He wants to find them, you know? So I don't think it's just academia. By the way, that guy would get totally canceled if you were a teacher today. Uh, do you see those girls in his class? Love you. I'd get in so much trouble. Richard goes on to say, I've been watching For All Mankind, and I'm pretty annoyed by the 16x9 LCD displays becoming ubiquitous by the early 90s. 16x9 was a marketing gimmick, and considering the ubiquity of lithium, they would likely have HD CRTs. Terrible show. Hope it's canceled. I know, Richard. I know you're kidding. And I know you're joking about that, too. No, one of the things I think is really cool about for all mankind, even though it's a minor point, is that NASA owns um, NASA owns uh, um, all of the patents on the stuff it invents. And I'll tell you, CRT TVs. I know you're joking. I know you're joking. CRT TVs, heavy, 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 heavy. Uh, I think they would do everything they can to not have glass uh, or anything like that. And CRT TVs, you need you need the 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 cathode ray tube. You need that. Who wants that? No, they would have. They would have uh, come up with something new. <laughs> That's just me. Um, let's see. Um, here is oh, um, this is interesting. So we on our channel we have. Um, Roberto Suarez and Alex Montano. Alex is Mexican, but he lives in Colombia with his wife. And Roberto is Puerto Rican. So they came to me and they said, hey, we want to do an all-Spanish show on the channel. We've seen that, like, uh, Midnight's Edge has an all-Spanish show, and you've got Polly from Latino Slant promoting uh, the Latino culture on his on his channel. Love Polly, by the way. Um, and so they came to me and they wanted to make a show, and they wanted to call it – at first it was called Latin X Force – and I thought that was pretty cool. And then they called it Latin X-Men. And I thought that was pretty funny because they were both explained to me. Roberto said that the term Latin X actually came from Puerto Rican, some Puerto Rican scholars. And I thought that was interesting. But there was kind of a backlash. I mean, I had somebody write to me and say, you know, the term Latin X is like the N-word for black people. And I'm like, what? And Roberto said, that's not true. And I'm like, you know what? All this woke uh, people are, I, I don't. I mean, I even hate saying the word woke anymore, but but people, are, I, we've got to come up with a different word than woke. Um, a word that is more focused, I think, and and we understand. So this comes from Jesus Barbosa. Uh, Mr. R&B, quick word to salute you for your higher quality work and expressions. As a Hispanic man, I commend you on working toward a Latinx man future program, but be cognizant that a greater majority of Hispanics do not embrace Latinx a term I reluctantly, uh, uh, a term I reluctantly accepted Latino when it first became a oh Latinx term. I reluctantly accepted Latino when it first became a new label. By the way, I will not personally accept or respond to anyone addressing me as Latinx, because while I'm happy to address any Latinx who has expressed they prefer that denomination, I will not be named or defined anymore by others. I define myself. I rather do right than popular. This is simply a flavor of the year trend or fad. Bravo, sir. I totally agree with you. It is important to make clear to your audience also if you will be speaking in Spanish because I already see the comments in messaging that you are not receiving with that expectation. No, no, no. I will be speaking in English because uh, no hablo espanol. Muy poco. Um because the show is absolutely going to be in Spanish. And we've done two episodes of it now. We're going to do another episode of tomorrow. Uh, it's a bi-weekly show, and it's in Spanish. My honest best wishes, Robert, for embracing and practicing diversity and inclusion. I believe in the intentionality of how you carry yourself, Robert. I'm over 59 years old, and I want you to know I'm rooting for your success. Exito. I'm proud a U.S. two-time veteran, and if you feel like chatting or talking about Latino culture... I am, in truth, happy to talk to you in a rich and nuanced manner, given that I have worked with large multi-ethnic communities, as I have hosted large Latino events. I know you understand Latinos are not a monolithic body. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, 
Adelante, forward, amigo. Adelante, Adelante. Adelante, forward, amigo. Most respectfully, Jesus Barbosa. Jesus, what a great letter. Uh, thank you for that. I very much appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it, to me, I, I mean, like living in California, I think of, of Latin culture. First of all, I've been to Spain five times. And um, I, I think of, of, of Spain and Portugal and everything below the United States, meaning all of Mexico, Central and South America is Latin culture and all of its, and it is a rich culture and not the same all at all. And um, I love it. And I love the people and uh, love the culture. And uh, I think it's great, but I appreciate that, that, um, that letter. Here's an interesting one. This is pretty cool. Uh, this is about Wakanda forever. This comes from Jared De Los Reyes, and the subject headline is Wakanda Forever, Thoughts, Science, and Spirituality, and Overall Impressions of the Movie. While I thought Wakanda Forever was pretty good, I found it quite underwhelming. Admittedly, I came in with pretty high expectations in light of reviews I had seen, and unfortunately, the film didn't live up to those expectations. I was prepared to tear up in regards to Chadwick Boseman, but had no tears. I came in with an open mind of Shuri being Black Panther, but it still didn't work for me. Still of the opinion that T'Challa should have been recast, though Coogler handled it as good as he could have. Additionally, some of the logic posed by the movie was inconsistent for me. Power levels of the Talacans, they're all imbued with heart-shaped herb enhancements via their ancestry, but have a hard time with Wakandans and non dormelage Shuri is powerful enough to handle being impaled by pure vibranium and Killmonger dies from it. Namor doesn't go to the water 20 feet away. Doesn't he also restore his power from oxygen via the air and not only the water? I found myself thinking, huh? When these parts of the movie happened. I did think Namor and the Talacans were so awesome. I loved the dichotomy of science and spirituality shown via Shuri, but her arc could have been executed better. By the end of the film and in the final scene specifically, I wasn't convinced that her stance on spirituality and the ancestral plane had changed at all. She had a lot of dialogue articulating the steadfastness of her scientific perspective, but doesn't grow much beyond that. The memories of T'Challa were nice, but didn't convey growth or the development of her beliefs, in my opinion. I think it would have been more effective to have T'Challa's hand rest on Shuri's shoulder in the final scene, accompanied by Ramonda coming up and sitting next to her, and then play the memories of T'Challa's sequence. This would provide her an experience with her ancestors, and not just Killmonger. It would bring not only her prayer to Bast at the beginning, and her conversation with Ramonda at the river full circle, further developing Shuri's character, whilst also providing more to say in regards to this idea being brought up in the film. Rob, what are your thoughts on how the duality of science and spirituality was conveyed, along with Shuri's possible character development in the movie? Uh, would really appreciate a response in a Rob Observations video, video, but a written response would be cool too. Well, Jared, uh, I'll give you a, 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 how about I give you a response right here? Look, what I find really interesting about the MCU and frustrating is the gods as they exist within the MCU and how uh, our mortal, our mere mortals or our uh, other beings in the MCU relate to those gods. The Eternals, for instance, and their relationship with their gods, the Celestials. The fact that the ancestral plane exists. And if an ancestral plane exists, that means there's planes of existence throughout the MCU that we don't know about. And I find it fascinating that um, knowing that there is an ancestral plane and knowing that death is not the end necessarily would profoundly affect culture and the people that live in that culture. And I, it, it's opening a can of worms. Like, look, it's still comic book action adventure films. But if you know that there's an ancestral plane that you can actually access, and if it isn't just your own subconscious that you're accessing, but an actual plane where entities such as former, I don't know, Black Panthers can exist and you can interact with them, that would be profoundly impactful. I do find it very interesting that Marvel keeps skirting the edge of this because on one hand they could piss people off with their depiction of spirituality but because it's the mcu they can get away with it i have been upset actually by all the different depictions like the egyptian gods 
you know, Ahmet fighting against Khonshu, were they really eating the souls of people on the streets of Cairo? Was that a mass casualty event? I don't know. They don't seem to ever care about it. How is humanity affected by Arish and the Judge in the sky above the UK? Uh, a, a celestial coming out of the Indian Ocean. No one seems to have mentioned it. These would profoundly affect mankind. And even how does man, that's why I really want them to do a, uh, an adaptation of Marvels, the Marvel series that was told from the point of view of mortal men. What does is, what is regular humanity think? You know, what is, what is the Pope, how does the Pope weigh in? in the MCU about all of these events. What does he say about Arshem the judge? I mean, what's going to be really interesting, I know I'm overthinking this, but now we know that Kevin Bacon, we're going to see tonight at midnight, Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special drops, which I'm, it got great reviews and variety. I can't wait to watch this. But okay, if Kevin Bacon now exists in the, and I know people are going to say, Rob, but go with me here. Kevin Bacon now exists in the MCU. He is a real person that exists in the MCU. Now, he has an he is he is somebody analogous. He, there's but he's not the Kevin Bacon from our world, which I understand. But in the MCU, a Kevin Bacon exists. It's after all the multiverse. My question to you is this. Are they going to mention that Kevin Bacon was the leader of the Hellfire Club in X-Men First Class? Does he have an X-Men First Class poster? In his, uh, in, in, are they going to acknowledge it at all? Because if so, if they make the X Men movie, X Men First Class canonical, that means that X Men comics, I mean, how does that, from a belief perspective, what does that do to your cosmology? <laughs> when the X Men, I mean, I know I'm being a little cheeky, but kind of, because if you're going to say that Kevin Bacon exists, how deep are you going to go into that? And I know I've heard that James Gunn has said something about they've changed movies around that Kevin Bacon was actually in, like in the MCU he's in a different... But anyway, I, I just think that they haven't really reconciled. I love the battle between faith and science. I, you know, I've heard once that when faith and science figure it out, they're both going to find each other at the top of the same mountain. I don't know if that's true, but I, I, I find that they're both... I mean, the universe, unfortunately, is unknowable to us. So uh, we're never going to have those answers, so we're always going to have faith. How we we use that faith to make sense of our universe is going to be something that we are going to continue to grapple with. And I find that, you know, what's amazing, the more science, the more we, the more, the more we are illuminated as to how the universe works. Look at the James Webb te Space Telescope. The more amazing it becomes. And the more we learn about the universe, the more we understand that the machinations of the universe are pretty extraordinary. And I think that there's room for both, really. I mean, I don't believe in God the way we think of God because God is an anthropomorphization of us. Say what you want. I mean, uh, you start asking people what their uh, heaven or hell or God or Satan or whatever, it's always anthropomorphized. And I'm like, really? Because that, that's so Earth-centric. <laughs> Earth, the center of the universe as far as God is concerned. I mean, I know we'd like to believe that, but, you know. Anyway, it's always a tough call. I find it fascinating. It's one of the things I love the most. I love stories that deal with the conflict of faith and science. I love it. Hassan Chavez, oh, uh, Hassan Chavez said, uh, well, he retracted a message. But Hassan, thank you for whatever you retracted. Thanks for supporting the channel. Uh, Alex Detman. Alex, um, oh, wow, um, okay, uh, Alex says, this is for Fernando, we all know is bravely fighting cancer, and I say we start putting some funds together so we can help him through this very tough time, um, Rob, we're a family in the PGS, and I say we try and keep his awesome spirit up, this is a great, uh, a great, a great thing you've done here, and I will get this to him. So, for those of you who don't know, Fernando Barrero, who is a very longtime member of this community, is fighting cancer. And, um, you know, I saw him last weekend, and I'm going to try and get in touch with him. It was my intent to get in touch with him this weekend to maybe get him on the show, uh, check in with him, see what his spirits are. I'm going to try and do that 
and have him on either tomorrow or Saturday if he is up to it because uh, he's a great guy. And uh, I love Fernando Barrero. Actually, Fernando Barrero. I love just saying his name. So I think that um, we'll do that. I think it's a great idea, Alex. You're a good man for, for coming up with that. But you know what? Uh, I'll ask him about that. Some people get weird about doing stuff like that, but I will ask him. Uh, I think it's a great idea, and thank you for bringing it up. Reamer Bulldog says, Theory, I think Kang shows up in the Marvels post-credits because he needs Miss Marvel's bangles for something. I agree. And if Quasar does show up, we're going to see. There's going to be a lot of a lot of stuff's going to go down as far as I am. Um, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. That's going to be... Um, very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, did I read this? This is really... This is really interesting. Um, I'm going to read this anyway. I think I've read it before, but I think it's a good, good read for today. Is the rise in streaming contributing to societal divisions? And this comes from Joseph Weeks. Joseph says... Hello again, Viceroy. As I, as most people do, enjoy the benefits of the rise in streaming. The immense wealth of quality content it provides at the tip of my fingers is incredible. However, I do get concerned and saddened by one of the effects that streaming services have. There is a societal trend of everyone becoming increasingly isolated. Takeout is replacing dining in. Online shopping is replacing the mall. And streaming is replacing the movie theater. The result of all this is that the average person is retreating heavily into their own world and being less forced to interact with people outside their own inner circle. Instead of getting to know each other and discover the commonalities between us, humans must base our opinions on anecdotal evidence we see on social media or snippets of human behavior on the news. Often, these types of glimpses display one extremely unnuanced side of a person. The less we know of a person, the less likely we are to find a sense of commonality and instead focus on what divides us. It is much more pleasant to focus on what brings us together. The movie theater is a place designed to bring people together, both physically and metaphorically. People of every gender, race, religion, etc. decide to pack into a room and embark on the same emotional experience of seeing a piece of art together. As the lights dim, all identities recede and these disparate individuals combine to be one greater whole. In moments such as Toby's return in No Way Home or Cap whispering Avengers Assemble in Endgame, when the whole audience cheers in unison, everyone works together and for a few hours forgets the differences between them. The point I'm trying to make is that I'm worried that the rising costs of movie tickets and the ease of sitting on the couch to watch a movie that streaming is going to encourage more people to avoid having these shared experiences that bring us, as a human race, closer together. Obviously, simply going to the movies is not going to magically heal our nation. Maybe, though, it can provide the smallest and briefest amount of community, and any sense of community is worth fighting for. Plus, movies are much more fun and satisfying when shared with others in a theater. Anyways, I was wondering what your thoughts were on this topic. As always, thanks for what you do, and keep on dreaming. Wow, that's a great, uh, what a great letter, Joseph. Well, I I have to say, um, as many of you know, I I talk about this a lot on the channel, and you, Joseph, um, really nailed it. The idea of going to a movie, one of the things I've always loved about movies, and one of the things I find marvelous about movies is what Joseph said. You have people from all walks of life, all different kinds of people, different shapes, sizes, colors, creeds, sexualities, economic backgrounds, religious beliefs, whatever. But everybody's interested in whatever story they've come to see, whatever movie they've come to see. Despite all those differences, we've all come together and agreed to sit next to one another. I mean, nobody seems to ever care. I don't really notice because I don't pay any attention, but you know, all those differences melt away when you go to a movie theater, especially now that you can pick your own seats. You never know who you're going to sit next to. And you sit down into a theater, into a movie theater, and you trust that your fellow person next to you is there for the same reasons you are. And hopefully they're not going to be looking at their goddamn phone. 
I mean, I like to, you know, when people are on their phone, I like to do things like whisper in someone's ear, if you don't put your phone away, I'm going to slit your throat from ear to ear. I find that works for me. No, but seriously, I everyone sits there to have a, a communal experience together, and that's when it's most fun. I mean, when I saw Wakanda Forever, it was an incredibly diverse crowd, and I, um, you know, was sitting, I was sitting behind a group of like ten black women, and they were crying. I mean, they were, I felt the emotions. I mean, the emotions were emanating from them. But what was the best part about it was I didn't think they were necessarily Marvel Cinematic Universe fans. They were obviously fans of Chad Bozeman and Wakanda, but they stayed not just in the credits. They didn't get up. They were talking amongst themselves and they were having conversations. And I kind of waited, I was eavesdropping, listening and their commentary was fascinating. And how much the movie moved them and all that. And I kind of, and it took them, the the um, uh, uh, the ushers had to come in. They had to clean up the theater for the next showing. We got kicked out. I was just kind of sitting there listening to them talk. But it was really interesting because they were clearly a big group of friends that had planned this night, you know, gone to see the movie opening night. But it was fascinating that they might have been interested in different things and, and, than I was about the film. But I learned, man, they were moved. And, and you know, they were not, MCU fans, but they were clearly moved by this movie. And, you know, for those of you who ever watch uh, Midnight Musings, Lael Rockwell, who is one of the co-hosts, he tells the story about how a woman who came with her two sons, a woman, like she, he said she was 70, I believe, and he, she patted his hand at one point and explained to him that she had lost her son to cancer and that watching Wakanda Forever was incredibly cathartic to her. And we have to remember, man, that, that, that movies, I mean, John Campy always says they're experiential, they're, they're, uh, ex they're experiences and they are, you know, great stories are enveloping and they surround you. They bind you. Um, and they get inside your, your heart, your imagination, your emotions, all of that. And they're important. Stories are absolutely important. So, uh, that's, I agree. I mean, look, do I think we're ultimately what Joseph Weeks want to know? Do we, are we becoming more closed off to one another? Yes, I think we are, and that's why I think going out into the world, and and everybody expects again. I hate this idea that everybody expects the world to bend to who they are. If you should know who you are, and you know what, if if you want to be called something, if you are, uh, if you want to be, let's say you're non-binary, or you're using they them pronouns, if you go into the world. You can't expect people to know that about you right away if they haven't met you or if they're going to, you know, just assume that you're going to be misgendered. I know it sucks. I mean, people don't know I'm Jewish. And they're always like, you're Jewish? I mean, I, can't, I was adopted into a Jewish family and then I found out my biological mother was Jewish. So yes, by all intents and pur for all intents and purposes, um, I am Jewish. Uh, my family built a, a chapel at a synagogue. I had to go to Sunday school and religion school most of my life. I had to learn Hebrew. I was bar mitzvah. I'm Jewish. But, you know, people, I don't get mad when people uh, misreligion me. <laughs> you know, I don't look traditionally Jewish, but I don't get pissed when people go, you're Jewish? I mean, I, I, yes, I understand I don't look, and when I went to Israel, I was very surprised that a lot, a lot of people didn't look Jewish either. But um, I don't get mad about that. I don't th think people should get mad about that. I think you have to. People need to go out in the world and be more tolerant. And remember that the rest of the world is not paying as much attention to you as you think they are, or as much as you might want them to. And I think we all need to to get away from our computers and go out into the world and interact with people because it has been my experience, and I've traveled around the world that people are pretty great. Yeah, there's assholes out there, and yeah, you got to make sure that you're not in places where a criminal element's going to come after you. But for the most part, I've been to Asia, I've been to Europe, uh, the places I've been to, I've been to the Middle East. People are pretty great, and for the most part, even I've even been mugged in a foreign country in Australia, and I love Australia, um, but you can get mugged here too. For the most part, people are pretty great, and I have discovered when you sit down with people. And show genuine interest in them. Talk to them. Ask them questions. They're 
delightful. And um, we need to do more of that. I think we got to get offline and stop arguing about all the things we argue about and just go, go enjoy people. Go enjoy the world. The, the, it's, it's much better than the internet. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you something I did. So we have relatives in town from, I did not know this, but uh, 25 minutes away from my front door, if you drive up into the mountains and you get to 5,500 feet, I am in Southern California. They discovered about 100 years ago, it's the perfect elevation to grow apples. This is, this is 25 minutes from my door, right up in the mountains. There, there are wineries up there. There's places that make incredible apple brandy that's 90 proof. It's, ooh, it's tasty. Uh, 25 minutes from my door. I didn't even know that. Uh, I've lived in Southern California for like 30 years. I had no idea that this this place was up there. It's beautiful, unbelievable. And uh, I wouldn't have known that. Just get out of the house. Go find some shit. Go, go do some things. I've often said, play a game with yourself. Call up some, not that game. Uh, call some friends up. And once a month, take a trip. And take a trip within 120 miles of where you live. Doesn't matter where you live. Find a place to go that you've never been. There's, I guarantee you that there's a place to go within 120 miles from where you are and go there. Go there with no agenda or whatever. Find, find some place that seems interesting. Get in a car. Pick up your friends at 7 a.m. Y'all leave at 7. You'll get to wherever you're going at 9. Do it on the weekend. And when you get there, go have a meet. Go to a local diner. Find a, Walk around. Talk to people. You know, it might not be the most interesting place in the world, but people live there. Find out. There's got to be something interesting about it. Go uh, go to a church. Go to a church. Talk to a pastor. Say, hey, look, we just we decided there's four of us. We, 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 we take these trips and do it once a month. Change your life, I swear to God. Um, just try it. Um, Martino, Simone, Martino, the man who created... Play track, and I owe him. I will send you the dialogue I owe you this week. Martino says, "Wow, finally catching you live. Happy Geeks Giving." Well, Martino, you're a good friend, and I wouldn't be where I am without you today, literally. Um, uh, so it's good to see you. Thank you, and of course, I can't. People love that last episode of Play Track. If you have not seen Martino Simone's episodes of Play Track, they're very fun, and there's four of them on the channel, the Burnett Network. Check them out. Play Track. Episodes 0, 1, 2, and 3. And he's working on episode 4 now. And they keep getting bigger every episode. Uh, Squirt Russell says, The past is dying like shrimp on my breath. Punish us. <laughs> the past is always dying. It's been dying forever. Uh, Terrier says, If the world would bend to me, I'd be a gummy bear. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, yes. Uh, you probably would. Uh, and who's to say you wouldn't be, but you know, I like that. Um, uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay. Uh, wow. There's okay. Hang on. Uh, let me go back. There's some tips now. Hitchcock is the goat sends in a tip and says, I'm waiting for Yellowstone to expire at Peacock and revert back to Paramount plus before I subscribe. Imagine HBO max trying to increase subscribers with house of the dragon while game of Thrones was at Peacock. You can't not have a flagship show like Yellowstone. I don't, dude, I don't understand. I'll tell you, they thought Star Trek was going to be that. It is not. It is not. And why they don't make big changes as far as the Star Trek franchise is concerned, they don't even talk about it. Yellow, I mean, Yellowstone is now a cinematic universe. I loved 1883. I can't wait to see the Helen Mirren, Harrison Ford story. And they're going to do more. I mean, it's amazing. But you're right. Well, I mean, but they don't, they didn't know. I mean, they had to make licensing deals, so they're kind of stuck with those deals. But they'll end. Uh, Stub McShave says, which were the first actresses or maybe actors that made you hot and bothered in your young years? For me, it was Carrie Fisher, Lizette Anthony, and Olivia Hussey. Well, the first, the first woman that ever made me hot and bothered was Nichelle Nichols. I mean, I love Lieutenant Uhura and her big green hoop earrings. And let me tell you, the sexiest thing I had seen when I was five years old was Nichelle Nichols in Mirror Mirror <laughs> with her exposed midriff. Whew, man, what a beauty she was. My God. 
Um, but then after that, I uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors, you know, uh, Farrah Fawcett in Charlie's Angels, but in Logan's Run, you know, and Jenny Agater in Logan's Run, dropping trow in the ice cave. Come on. I mean, all those, that was great stuff back then. I also really had a crush on Kim Richards, not before the Housewives of Beverly Hills. She was Tia <laughs> in Escape from Witch Mountain. Uh, and I got to say this. I mean, I didn't know she wasn't playing for my team, but I had a crush on Jodie Foster in Candle Shoe. <laughs> I did. Um, I know, they're, they're, but those that's when I was a, a little kid. When I, when I grew up, I mean, Barbara Bach, Agent Anya Masava and Spy Love Me. I was a I was a big Bond guy. I, I look. I loved I loved the women in Star Trek, and and the women of classic Star Trek were they were they were. I mean Barbara Boucher in the episode by any other name. Wow! Just look that one up. Oh my God! Uh, but there were so many good Barbara Anderson in Conscience of the King. So I even had a girlfriend named Christina Vincent. I was uh, she was be- Christina. She's still beautiful, but she looked like Barbara Anderson. So those are people that, yeah. <laughs> uh, Richard says Michael Waldron is the de facto head writer of the MCU because it can have a script on the table whenever the bosses want. Pretty nice journey for a Rick and Morty staff writer. Hollywood is fun. Tells you that Marvel can't change though. Yeah, you know Michael Waldron. I think the jury is out on that. Um. Uh, the jury's out on that. I, I, um, uh, look, TV writers can write quickly. We, we shall see. I, where, I think that Marvel can change. I, I do. It depends how they're going to. It's going to be interesting to see where it all winds up. But I have to say that I think that my enthusiasm for Marvel, I mean, Wakanda Forever was their 30th movie, but I thought the 23 movies of the Infinity Saga were pretty great. I, in a way, I mean, I know they wouldn't because of the money, but if you left it there, it would have been one of the greatest franchises in film history, bar none. So Richard goes on to say, so did Ellen and Larry actually sleep together? Okay, so Ellen, President Ellen in, in For All Mankind, one of the main characters of uh, For All Mankind, who was an astronaut and later became president of the United States and then came out, uh, she was gay. and and Or she is gay. And Larry, her husband, is also gay. And they early on created a relationship to, to keep themselves so they could, because obviously at the time, beginning in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, the world was like it was here. It was not as progressive as it is now. And... Uh, so what Richard is cheekily asking is, did Ellen and Larry actually sleep together? I would say this. I would say they did. I would say that Ellen and Larry's kids are actually, um, they're actually together. Uh, I mean, actually they're kids. I think they really had kids and I think they did sleep together. And I, I, I mean, I can't answer this, um, because I am not, I, I've actually never had a conversation with a, a gay man or a gay woman about this. So I'm talking, let me clarify this, but I'm talking out of my ass. And we are talking about two fictional characters that are married, but they're both gay and they have other partners. I don't think that a person's, I think that the actual physical act, like maybe they needed some help or something, but I don't think that you might be attracted to another person, but I don't think that that means that Larry couldn't get it up. I think that there's ways, like when you get a physical, when you get a massage, you know, I've had massages, physical massages, and I'll admit it, both men and women have given me massages. I've had massages from both, and I've found both to be, I've, I've been aroused getting a massage, just having another human being's um, um, hands on your body, you know, and feeling them, you, you, it's arousing. So I would imagine that Larry and Ellen probably could have made it work they were they're scientists they would have figured out okay and from a scientific standpoint um i think they could have made it work and there are ways to be stimulating while ellen might not have turned her on uh i'm sure that she could have hooked up hooked it up for larry and made it work again i don't know the, but that's an interesting question mike uh, richard that you've had might that be could that happen i don't know I wonder if uh, I'm sure that gay couples in the past 
uh, men and women who have been married under the auspices of, of cover or whatever have been able to procreate. Something tells me, especially because they were scientists, and when you've been in space, even if you're gay, I'm sure you can figure out how to procreate. And they have their own kids, and they love their own kids. And I think that that's, but that's an interesting question. Maybe they'll deal with that in season uh, three. Who knows? Um, we shall see. Um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I think I am all caught up. Let me just make sure. Um, no, I'm not quite caught up. Uh, Mikey Lito says, I wanted to like the Fablemans more than I did. I can't wait to hear your opinion of it. It's a highly personal movie. The menu is great, by the way. I'm seeing all these movies this weekend, so I will do that. Ooh, 200 Watt Studio says the woman that caught his attention was Miss St uh, Stephanie Powers and the $6 million man. Oh, my God. Stephanie Powers was not only was she hot AF in the $6 million man, she was an alien. <laughs> so uh, what's not to love? What's not to to love so yes i uh that stephanie powers that's a good one i love jamie summer jamie summers Lindsay wagner did it for me too um now that i mention it and on that note everyone i want to wish first of all everyone a very happy turkey day a very happy thanksgiving thanks so much for listening to this stream i want to thank everybody for writing letters in if you want to write letters in, you can send them right down there at postgeeksingularity.com uh, I changed the name of this channel back to the Burnett work originally because of mostly because it's more of a YouTube issue because we had a, it's you can still find us as the Burnett work. So it's the Burnett work home of the post geek singularity. We're not going to change much around, but the YouTube channel is going to stay as the Burnett work, at least for the time being. I hope you're all with uh, those of you who are Americans or with people that you love or, or not with people you hate, but you get good food. Either way, be with people. If not, go see a movie. And I want to thank everybody for generously supporting this channel via super chats and tips i want to thank uh my moderators lord toth is here i love when lord toth is here tom jr jackson's here um i think uh i don't know who i think that's who else is here yeah i want to thank you guys for being here. louise x sparrow is here too um and louise i'm gonna get you to watch season three and i think you're gonna like it uh but anyway i want to thank all of you for being here and all of those things um and now I'm going to let you guys go. But remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I will say to everybody, have a better day. And watch Andor. And tell me what you think. <laughs>